Uh, with that lesson, Clayton Toon. Thank you. I wish my boss would announce my name like that at work when I walked in the building. <laughs> okay, if you got a Bible, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 15. Go to verse 29. Matthew 15, 29. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking and the crippled made well, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they praised God. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where can we get enough food in this place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground and then he took seven loaves and the fish and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over and the number of those who ate was 4,000 besides women and children. Some of you have asked me what my lesson was on today when I said the feeding of the 4,000. It was almost like, oh, heard that a thousand times. We all know this story. Have you heard this story a thousand times in the feeding of the 5,000? Because if I go back one page in my Bible to Matthew chapter 14, I've got the feeding of the 5,000. I find that as I go through these two accounts, they are strikingly similar. I'm going to read from this for a little bit because I've got some things that I think are, are worth noting. Only Matthew and Mark give you these two stories. John and Luke won't touch them. Both stories begin with large crowds following Jesus and bringing sick people to Jesus to be healed. Both stories say that Jesus responded to the crowds out of his compassion. That word occurs in both stories. Both stories say that Jesus responded to the crowds and both stories say that Jesus wanted to feed the crowds. Both stories said that in order to feed the crowds, he turned to his disciples. Both stories tell us that Jesus fed the crowds with the same thing, fish and bread. Both of these stories tell us that before Jesus fed the crowds, he had them sit down on the grass in the 5,000 and on the ground in the 4,000. And both of these stories tell us that he gave thanks for the food. They both say the crowd ate and they were satisfied. That word satisfied occurs in both stories. Uh, both stories, one of them 5,000 eat, the other one 4,000 eat, and both say that does not include the women and children. And in each story, there are basketfuls of food left over. So you have two stories, one of them right after the other, one in chapter 14 and chapter 15. So why in the world does Matthew tell you two stories? Why do you have two of the same story? No, it's not. Why would you have two of the pretty much same story back to back? What is Matthew trying to tell you? Or is it just there? There are a lot of reasons for both of these stories. If you go through commentaries or just talk to a scholar, some of them will say, well, Mark was the earliest gospel writer. Mark wasn't an eyewitness, so he had to do his research. And what Mark, what Mark found was there were two stories. One had 5,000, one had 4,000, so he just put them both in there. Well, if that's the case, then Mark just ends up being a collector of stories with no real reason as to why he's writing this book. But that's okay. I, could, I mean, I could see that. I don't agree with it, but I can see it. But that doesn't explain Matthew. So what they go on to say is that, well, because Mark wrote first, Matthew read Mark. And if you read these two books together, they tell pretty much a lot of the same stories. So Matthew read Mark, and Mark told two stories, and Matthew tells two stories. I have a real problem with that thought process. I've got a problem with how they talk about Mark, but I've got a real problem with how they discuss Matthew, because Matthew was there. Matthew's an eyewitness. So if Jesus really didn't feed 5,000 people on one occasion and 4,000 people on the next occasion, but Matthew presents it like he does... Then what does that say about Matthew's ethics as a writer? I think people have a hard time looking at these stories and taking both of them because you just can't imagine that after feeding 5,000 people that the disciples would wonder, where are we going to get this much food? So let's look at why Matthew might tell these two stories. The feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 are very similar, but there are some differences in them. 
One of the differences in the feeding of the 4,000 in Matthew, in Matthew, and you won't see this in Mark, this is why it should send a red flag to you, is that when Jesus has them gather, they are gathering on the mountainside. Now, why that's so important is that the Jews thought and they believed that when the Messiah was going to come back, he would gather all of Israel on the mountainside. There's a passage in Jeremiah 31 that talks about this. And the Jewish people believed that when the Messiah gathered them on the mountain, that there was going to be this great healing. This is in Isaiah 35. The Jews also thought that the Messiah, in gathering these people, that there would be this great banquet of food, of choice wines and choice meats. And that's in Isaiah 25. So Matthew was trying to tell you that by this story, this is the same Messiah that was talked about in the Old Testament. He's gathering them on the mountainside. There's this great healing. I can see that. But I've got a little bit of a problem with that interpretation of this story. And I'm sure that you're sitting there saying, if you have all these problems with all these stories, why are you telling us all this? But you've now spent ten minutes telling us all the things that you don't like about it. Because all of these writers have a different point to make. At the end of John, he tells you that Jesus did so many miracles that you could not fit them all in all the books of the world. So if he did all these miracles, then why in the world did John, Luke, Matthew, and Mark only give you ten, or seven, or nine? Why those? Why not other ones? What are you trying to tell me? So I want you to think through this with me. Matthew, of all the Gospel writers, is the least shy when it comes to reminding you that what Jesus is doing was foretold in the Old Testament. He mentions this more than any of the other Gospel writers put together. And yet, in these two stories, he never once cites the Old Testament. Something to note. Then the thing is, when people get this book, they don't need proof that Jesus is the Messiah. They were there. They saw him. These are already Christians. They believe Jesus was the Messiah. So why would you write a book reminding me to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? I already believe in that. So what else could Matthew possibly thought? In both stories, a word appears. And it is the word compassion. So I've given you all these reasons as to why I don't think that these two stories are written. Let me tell you why I think Matthew did write these two stories. And you can see what you think. You have this word compassion that appears in both of them. It is the motivation of Jesus for healing. It is the motivation of Jesus for feeding these people. And Matthew is very interested in this idea of compassion. He mentions that word more than Luke, John, or Mark. He mentions it more than all three of them put together. Matthew is very interested in this idea of a Messiah of compassion. Now, I've told you before that the people who got this book were early Christians. Now, what do we know about early Christians? Did they have an easy life? No. You didn't kill because you believe in God. They live in such an honorable, ethical way of life. And it puts to shame the pagans who live near them. And yet, because of that, they have to die for it. Matthew wants to remind you, this is a Messiah of compassion. Jesus feels for you. But it's not just the Christians that Jesus feels for. The story talks about the crowd. You see, I mean, the, the crowd itself can pretty much be a character in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They, they are their own character. They're not Christians. They're sort of the, the hangers-on. They have a passing interest in Jesus, but they don't really know how they feel about him. They're the same ones who are going to scream for his blood later. Jesus feels for them. This idea of a compassionate Messiah rings very, very true for Matthew. We look at today's times. I guess this is a, this is a bad economy. So I can use the example of losing your job. You lose your job, Jesus feels for you. There's not a single one of us in here, I would imagine, who don't know somebody or ourselves who have lost our job. I have a friend of mine who, before the economy tanked, 50 years old, been working for the same company for 30 years. And just all of a sudden, you're fired. No reason. Can't afford to keep you. Now what? What are you going to do about that? It's fine for people to say, I'm, I feel for you, but that's hard, man. We know people like that. Jesus feels for you. You have somebody who's dying, you have a sick relative, Jesus feels for you. But he also feels for that sick relative. Jesus feels for our world, who... Oh gosh, I mean, this world is just dying. This world is sick with no hope. And they have no hope for tomorrow at all. And Jesus 
for some odd reason, feels for these people. This is the Messiah that, that Matthew tries to paint for you. There's a reason that you repeat something. You want to underline it. I must repeat myself to my son eight times a day, and for some reason he doesn't get it sometimes. And when I say don't run, you can't run! I have to repeat it to get it in his head. You re- if you repeat something, you're emphasizing a point. But that isn't enough for Matthew. This Jesus is one who calls his disciples to be a conduit through which compassion can flow. Because as you notice, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you do it. In one story, the disciples say, hey, Lord, look, it's getting late. You've got to send these people home because we ain't got no food. And what does Jesus say? Well, fix it. You feed them. In the other story, after the 5,000, they for some reason say, Lord, what are we going to do? And in this one, it was Jesus' idea. We've got to feed these people. And Jesus takes the bread, he prays over it, breaks it, gives it to his disciples, who in turn give it to the people. It's repeated. You and I, who act as the disciples of Christ, are the conduit through which compassion for God can flow to people. So that means that you and I have to practice compassion. Anybody read that book, The Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell? Raise your hand if you did read that book. Nobody read that book. Man, it's a good book. Um, he talks a lot about why people are successful. So he looks at Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. You know, what, what makes these people different than the crowd? He also talks about the Beatles. But he has a chapter called 10,000 Hours. And if you don't read the book, just read this chapter. Why are they so successful? It's because they spent 10,000 hours on their craft. He gives you Steve Jobs' history. This is what he did as a child. This is why he became who he did. A lot of it's right place, right time. But he put in 10,000 hours of work. The Beatles. How did they become the band that is still so popular today? Because they worked 10,000 hours. If you're married in this room right now, raise your hand. Ladies, don't laugh. Would you, and if this is not the case, don't say anything. Is your husband a better husband today than he was when you first got married? No, don't say no. <laughs> Why is that? Because you trained him. <laughs> uh, uh, this stuff takes practice. It is, we can't expect to be the best husband on day one. We can't expect to be the best husband on day five. Probably not going to be the best husband on year 50. But it gets better. If you work in the government, I've, I'm on contract with the government. But the government will only hire the government. And that takes time to get in there. And you want somebody who's got experience. So we believe in the idea of experience for all this stuff. And putting in the time, even our marriages, it takes time. And yet we have such a hard time when it comes to reading our Bible, praying, visiting people. This stuff takes practice. When you become a Christian, it's not going to be easy. You will probably, hopefully, be a better Christian in 25 years than you are today. But you've got to start doing something. And it takes time. So how, do I be, how can I be compassionate? Anybody got a bulletin? Get your bulletin. You got to put the sick in here, don't you? Okay. You get home, find the people who are sick in this bulletin and pray for them. That's not easy to do. It's hard to put a schedule. I'm doing it every day or doing it once a week. My wife trying to do it once a week. We get the bulletin and we'll go through and pick out people and we'll pray for them. Well, I, don't, I, I don't know them. Find out who they are. You're part of the same family. My father is huge on people going to the hospital. I am so bad about going to the hospital. Because sometimes I just don't know them. And, and, and that's an excuse. If somebody's in the hospital, you go see them. Well, I don't know them. Get a directory and find out who they are. Put a face to a name. But if that's not the case, then just go to the hospital and knock on the door. They'll let you know if they don't want visitors. And if you don't know them, just say, you know, Hi, I'm Clayton Toon. Don't say my name. Say your name. <laughs> uh, say, you know, Hi, I'm, I'm Clayton. Uh, we're a part of the same church family. I'm sorry I don't know you, and I'm sorry that you're here. But I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do? Can I pray with you? They'll probably say no. Not to the praying part, but to doing something for them. But at least you were there. And if they're not there, write a note that says, Hey, I came by. Hope you feel better soon. They will see that you are a compassionate person. My grandfather was, this is years ago, on my mom's side, was in the hospital for weeks. Man, he, he, he attended a big church. 
Um, but he got cards from everybody. People he didn't, he didn't even know are sending him cards to get well. And it's funny because he goes through he went through cards at that time a lot differently than I do or some of you might. I'm sitting here shaking the card to get the money out. And he didn't do that. He almost didn't even care what the card said. He just wanted to know who it was from because it means so much. That's compassion. I'm surprised at the number of people I meet who have never gone to a funeral. If you've not been to a funeral, I know that I'm, I'm a guest speaker, so I'll, I'll be bold here. <laughs> I can say that and not get fired. If you've never been to a funeral, you need to go. Everybody's going to die. We're all going to have people in our lives who are going to die. You can't escape it. You should take your children. My child's too young. It's not an excuse. My child has been to every funeral that I've been to. Doesn't matter how old they are. Well, I want to shield my child from that. They're too young to experience death. That's foolish. You can't shield your child from life forever. Being a child means learning to be an adult. You have to know what it's like to be an adult. But more importantly, you have to teach your child how to be a conduit through which compassion can flow. You take them. You let them see death. You let them experience grieving. You let them experience what it's like to comfort other people. One of the reasons I don't think that this feeding of the 4,000 is this messianic banquet that the Jews so hardly believed in that's talked about in Isaiah and Jeremiah. One of the reasons that I don't think it's that is because it talks about giving the choice meats and the choice wines. And Jesus doesn't even give them fish sandwiches from McDonald's here. I mean, this, is, this is nothing. So I don't think that's it. I think Matthew's on to something different here. This idea that whatever you have, whatever you personally have, to use it for the benefit of others, to pray about it to God, and to give it. God will bless it. It will be enough. But whatever we have as a people, to give that to God and in turn pray that this be blessed to give to people. Starting with Jesus, to the disciples, to us, to those around us. The Pharisees, though, they don't seem to pick up on this message. The disciples don't either. But the Pharisees really don't. Because in chapter 16, after the feeding of the 4,000, it begins with the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and they tested him by saying, hey, give us some kind of a sign that shows us that you're really who you are. And I read that and I think, are you kidding me? He just fed 5,000 people. He fed 4,000 people. Look at all the stuff that he's done. All the people he's healed. What in the world? What, what kind of a sign do you want to make you know that he is the Messiah? But when I do that, I missed it too. Because you see, the sign wasn't the power. The sign was the compassion. How do I know that? Because Matthew already told you that. Go back to chapter 10. You don't have to read this. But in chapter 10, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, um, Are you the one that we're supposed to be looking for? Or is it somebody else? And Jesus says, You go tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. Now, you'll miss it. If you think that what Jesus is saying is you go tell John about all these great things that are happening, about my power. Because there's one thing in that list that requires no power at all. What is it? Faith. Well, the poor have the gospel preached to them. It doesn't require any power to do that. The signs are not the power, they are the sign of compassion. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees miss that. And they'll continue to miss it until the day he dies. We forget that because we live, in a, we live in a world that is influenced by the wrong things and by religion that is just doesn't choose to focus on that. Because the disciples have that same problem. As you continue to go, the disciples are walking along and they've left all this food behind that, they, that Jesus just made and they ain't got no bread now. And they're hungry. And Jesus says, you be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What does that mean? Well, what he's probably saying is we should have packed a lunch. We're walking all this way and we ain't got no bread and Jesus is just saying, hey, just don't think about it. And when Jesus hears this, he, 
becomes unglued. More so in Mark than in Matthew. The language of Mark is a bit more harsh. What is wrong with you people? How is it that you still don't get that I'm not talking about bread? I fed 4,000 people. How many basketfuls were left? I fed 5,000. How many basketfuls were left? This is not about bread. And then they got it. It made sense to them. He wasn't talking about bread that you eat. He was trying to get across to them. You'd be on your guard against the influence of people who care nothing at all about this idea of compassion. You watch yourselves. Matthew writes to first century Christians, this is what it means to be compassionate people. You are under a God and a Messiah who have compassion for you. You, in turn, must have compassion for those around you. And this is the example of what it means. If you are going to come under the rule of God in His kingdom, you have got to be a people of compassion. So you might be asking, Clayton, are you saying that in order to be a Christian, i got to be compassionate? No. Nope. I'm not telling you that at all. I don't think the text tells you that. But what I am saying is that if you are a Christian, God expects you to be compassionate. And he becomes very upset when we're not. Let's all stand and sing.